Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sterling Live. My name is Caitlin Brower. I'm Sterling's social media manager and your host for Sterling Live. I'm so excited to be back this week with another amazing guest. Uh, he is no stranger to Sterling Live. This is his, I think this is like your second or your third time on. Yeah, but I will go ahead and introduce you to our audience real quick. Um, so today we have Ian Murray, Senior Advisor of Trust and Safety for Sterling Backcheck. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of the screen, we are talking about international capabilities with background screening vendors with a focus on Canada today. So Ian, thank you so much for joining me on Sterling Live. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. And thanks, Caitlin. It's uh, it's awesome to be back. So uh, to those of you that uh, don't know me, I'm uh, based on the West Coast here in uh, Vancouver, Canada. First joined Sterling way back in uh, 2005 and uh, spent uh, time looking after product for Canada and uh, served more recently as a sales leader. Uh, in, in my current role, as you mentioned, as Senior Advisor Trust and Safety, I, I represent Sterling on the PBSA, our industry association, and uh, DIAC, which is a Canadian group that focuses on digital identity initiatives here in Canada. Day-to-day, uh, -day, though, much of my time is spent supporting our clients as a subject matter expert on policy and best practice with, you guessed it, a, a focus on Canada. A focus on Canada, for sure. We're going to see that theme clearly throughout today's episode. But so great to have you on, especially because you've been with Sterling for so long. You know the industry, you know the region, so you are a true expert in the area. So I'm excited for our audience to learn so much uh, from you today. So at this time, if you are watching live on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions for Ian throughout the show, you can go ahead and put them in the comment section across these three platforms, and I will get them over to him as I see fit throughout the episode. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to start with an overview of, you know, Sterling's operating model in Canada. So can you just provide our audience, you know, a, a little look into uh, what our background screening capabilities are in Canada? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have offices in Vancouver and Montreal and support the full suite of screening services available in Canada. Uh, we've been the largest background screening provider in Canada for over 20 years. Uh, and for our industry, I think having that local presence is, is very important. Uh, if you look at the screening industry globally, there are some large global players and some small local firms as well. And that's no different with, with Canada. Uh, and I think there are some, some pros and cons to each. Uh, smaller local companies offer some expertise in the home region, but the moment that you open offices outside of your home country and want to hire candidates who live abroad, those local advantages may disappear. They may not even have that capability. Uh, on the other hand, many of the largest uh, organizations that provide background screening globally are, are US based and uh, are, may not offer a sufficiently local presence in region. So that can lead to a poor candidate experience and a lack of thought leadership for, for their clients. So uh, if I had a nickel or maybe since we're draping everything in maple syrup today, let's say if I had a loony <laughs> uh, for every time a large provider uh, or every time an American company opened an office in Canada and wanted to copy and paste their background screening policy into Canada, uh, I'd, I'd be a wealthy man. So, uh, and, and so I think that's why our industry continues to see acquisitions of regional screening mm -hmm. companies across the world. I think there's an acknowledgement that in order to be the most valuable partner possible to a business, the screening provider needs to have not just a global reach, but also local expertise. And I think that's something that Sterling really prides itself on. Uh, we continue to have a strong presence with a large team in Canada uh, which really helps in terms of candidate support, data residency, and, and that local thought leadership that I think really makes it uh, makes the program work. Well, unfortunately, this episode is not sponsored by maple syrup today, but I would have definitely, <laughs> I would have been all for that 100%. But yeah, I really like a lot of the points that you touched on, you know, Sterling being a trusted partner, you know, to all of our clients is critical. And we do talk about that partnership all the time. So for us to be locally on the ground, you know, supporting these organizations to where you brought up so many, you know, misconceptions sometimes with, you know, a local organization, a global organization who's hiring in X, Y, and Z's area. So for Sterling to really be, you know, in Canada and be one of the biggest providers and, you know, providing for our clients and partnering with them for success uh, is critical. So I'm really happy that you touched on all of those points there. Great. 
So let's look into um, privacy laws and ensuring compliance, because I know this is top of mind for many hiring professionals from many organizations. Um, how can organizations ensure that they are aware of, you know, the ever, ever evolving privacy laws and remaining compliant with their background screening programs? Yeah, that's, that's really the never ending question. And uh, gosh, privacy and compliance, everyone's favorite topic, right? <laughs> well, uh, let me say this, I, I find many HR leaders are not confident in their background screening policy. I, mm -hmm. I trust that that's safe to say and that if, if I could see everyone's face that was on here, there'd be some nodding. Uh, <laughs> and you mentioned it, there's consistent changes to privacy laws and best practice, not just in one particular country, but every region. And, and so it can be very tricky to keep everything current. Uh, I think the, the largest piece of advice that I'd have is that I, I notice sometimes our clients approach me with a very specific question. So for Canada, it might be about how to adjudicate a not clear result from a criminal record check or what type of check is right to do, what role social media screening can play. Very common questions, and I totally, I totally get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to stay on top of these trends, I would suggest having an active dialogue with your account manager. Uh, ensure that you engage in, in, in semi-frequent business reviews. Uh, when we begin operating with a new client, we often hear complaints about a previous vendor that maybe they didn't have a dedicated account manager, which, you know, I, that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's also many clients that we do already work with that have a dedicated account manager with us uh, who see no need to review or to catch up even as months and years go by. And I, I think I, I liken this to owning a car, you know, just because it doesn't break down and your route from A to B doesn't mean you don't need to take it in to get a tune up every now and then. Or right. an it's good to have a review and someone who knows what they're doing, look at it. Uh, and, and so I think that can help reduce risk. So th that's why one of my main roles this year actually is as an additional step beyond typical business reviews that our, our team will perform with you. Uh, part of my role involves performing what we call a diagnostic review of, of your screening program. So it goes beyond the day-to-day. -day. It's not looking at file-specific issues, but looking to ensure that your policy and practice is within the realm of your peers in the industry. So some benchmarking and just making sure that everything is, is current. Uh, this could involve things like making sure you're requesting the right services for the right roles, uh, again, consistent with your peers in the industry and with any evolving uh, legal changes. And uh, even delving deep into topics like pre-hire screening versus post-hire screening, the latest tech features and integrations available that might make things easier for, for your team, just to ensure that things mm -hmm. don't you know, fall out of practice. And you know, we've seen people that are still using paper forms, be and obviously those things should have disappeared years yeah. ago, so uh, you just never know. Yeah, and I, I, I like the car analogy um, because you're right. And if you even just look at, you know, not even just like laws and certain things that are changing, just think of the entire workforce altogether. So much has been changing, you know, over the last two, three years. And organizations yeah. are adapting to how to hire, who do they hire types of person, where are they hiring? You know, that's a huge conversation when we're talking about international capabilities right now. So where are they hiring? Everything like that. So doing this diagnostic review view is such an awesome feature from Sterling. It's so great that, you know, you're doing that with clients because it doesn't just, oh, once a year, let's talk and maybe something happens. You know, there's 12 months in a year, a lot can happen during that time. So these frequent conversations, these frequent tune-ups, like you had just said, are important for sure. Yeah. And, you know, that really, it's a concept that, you know, we've employed at times over the past while, but it really hit me on the head. Uh, let's continue the analogy, like a wrench hitting me on the head uh, over the past year, as all these conferences and networking events and trade shows have opened up again. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can say post COVID, but as we've mm -hmm. tried to put it in the rearview mirror, uh, one consistent theme that I've heard from HR professionals, whether it's a new HR grad that's just entering the workforce or a senior leader joining a new organization, is they're often asked to either build a new screening policy or review and update an existing one that they had no hand in developing in the first place. And there's often a gap. These HR pros are often coming to me saying, background screening wasn't a part of the HR curriculum when I was receiving my education on this. So I think there's a lot of demand for expertise from HR leaders on a topic that hasn't really received the attention it likely deserves as they're mm -hmm. coming up through, the, through an organization or through universities. So uh, we're hoping to help fill that gap a bit and build up some of that expertise in the HR community. 
Absolutely. And hey, that's what we're doing on Sterling Live Weekly. So <laughs> we're, we're getting the word out. We are making sure people are educated. So I think that's a great, great point for sure. Um, so real quickly, um, can you just, I know, because we were talking about, you know, privacy laws, you know, insurance compliance, everything like that. Uh, can you discuss Bill 96 for our audience? Sure. So I imagine half the audience might think Bill 96, what the heck is that? And, and <laughs> another group might think, oh, yes, I keep hearing about this and it's driving me crazy. So uh, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, so forgive any of the legalese that's, that's going to come out here. But uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, Bill 96 we take our languages very seriously here in Canada, especially Quebec. And uh, so Bill 96 offers significant changes to a previous bill designed to, you know, for the conservation of the French language in that area, which was Bill 101. Uh, so this was adopted back in, in May of 2022, well, earlier this year. And what the bill does is it opens the door to potential lawsuits against businesses that fail to service customers in French, provide communications in French, and post job descriptions and even publish job offers in French within the province of Quebec. So there's a new private right of action uh, provided to any Quebec resident to seek injunctive relief, uh, damages or, or punitive damages for violations of these provisions mm -hmm. of the charter. Uh, so to, to sound a bit less legalese about it, you know, it, there, it impacts a lot more businesses than it used to. So my understanding is this used to only impact businesses that had 50 employees in Quebec or up. Now it actually goes down to 25 and up. So there are thousands more businesses that are going to be uh, subject to this. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say subject to this, what that might entail is uh, a, a franchisation uh, process where there might be detailed inspections of business operations and the development of tailored compliance plans to ensure adherence to the local language laws. So, you know, it, it, if it's something that you don't feel fully versed in, it's something that you should be aware of. And I would recommend that you reach out to legal counsel to ensure compliance across the board, uh, but also your background screening vendor. So, I, you know, I can attest that, you know, with, with Sterling, we're fully bilingual and we can help protect you from that. Uh, but if you're not working with Sterling today, it would also be wise to reach out to your vendor and make sure that, they're, that they've got you covered uh, in, in, in terms of French language uh, support in Quebec. Yeah, an important update, you know, for, you know, those working within Canada and those watching today. So thank you for providing that, that update there. No problem. All right. So let's move into, I want to talk about some trends. Uh, we had briefly mentioned it before, you know, the, the workforce is constantly changing. So much is going on. So there's a lot of trends right now um, that are influencing background screening policies, programs, you know, everything that organizations are doing to get that right candidate in the door, to get them start day one. Um, so let's first take a look at identity verification and digital credentials. What should our audience uh, be aware of here? So I'd really love to, to separate these two a bit and, and yeah. let's maybe talk about uh, ID verification within the context of background screening in Canada first. Uh, as I think we talked about in our the last time we, we, we connected for Sterling Live a while back, social distancing uh, during COVID really highlighted the shortcomings of the current ID verification practice to obtain a criminal record check in Canada at the time. It was overly reliant upon knowledge-based authentication as the only approved online option or in-person ID verification as a fallback. And obviously that wasn't, uh, wasn't good uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> so thankfully policies were updated. It allowed the police to approve more advanced methods, including the use of biometrics among others uh, to ensure remote ID verification could take place. Mm. And this helped allow people to enter the workforce more quickly, especially important for industries like healthcare where both the demand for talent and the demand for high level screening requirements were also quite high. So, you know, ID verification in Canada, the, these advancements are beneficial for a few reasons. We've seen a decrease in time to hire because more candidates are able to authenticate their ID online in, in minutes rather than having to visit somewhere in person. That obviously improves the candidate experience overall. So you've got happier candidates and, uh, and also it can serve to help uh, enhance the fraud detection. So there was a recent high profile case here in Canada in the news where a woman was posing as a nurse for years in various provinces and even in the US as well. Uh, she was not a licensed nurse, but she was using the license of a completely different woman. Wow. And it really highlights how having a proper ID verification up front 
likely would have caught this. And, and mm -hmm. frankly, I see this as a bit of an issue across a lot of professions that have a licensing requirement where the licensing body themselves may insist that you have a criminal record check done when you first obtain your license. And so a lot of the, if we take healthcare, for example, a lot of the individual hospitals or health regions that may hire you kind of rely upon you having a valid license as the fact that your ID has been verified and you don't have a criminal record. But if you're using the license of someone else, you know, how are you verifying that you're yourself, Caitlin, or I'm not yeah. you know, somebody else entirely? So, you know, I think this case has kind of shared something that we've known for some time uh, more broadly in the market that it really uh, behooves any organization to verify an ID up front and not just trust that one credential you're seeing is it belongs to that individual. So, so that's the ID piece. I, mm -hmm. I think that really focuses on the, the, the first half of that uh, transaction. You know, it, it helps, you know, I guess as much as the advancements help candidates prove who they say they are up front and it accelerates the background check itself, uh, there's still the other half of that equation, uh, which is making your background check more portable once you've received it uh, so that you can provide your credentials wherever you work or volunteer. And I think that's where the concept of digital credentials comes in. Mm -hmm. And you know, for this, we're seeing amazing developments. You know, it could be a criminal record check, a safety certificate, uh, a degree or a trade license, you name it. It could be any any credential that you've got. Uh, both organizations and individuals alike have relied upon, at least in Canada in the past, folded copies of police certificates in your wallet if you're a, a maintenance worker arriving at a, at a school. Or if you have a bit more sophisticated program, maybe you use laminated badges with QR codes when a yeah. contractor arrives on site. So you know, we see both of these solutions in the market in Canada. But both of these solutions are a bit dated and require a lot of administration. Uh, you're often spending time replacing lost badges, tracking uh, renewals every year or two and reissuing badges with new dates, or you're revoking badges whenever someone leaves the organization. And, that's proven from, from groups that we've worked with. It, you know, it can be especially costly given the turnover that many of these organizations see for these types of roles. Right. Not to mention the administration and the time spent managing everything and waiting for the physical copies of the badges to arrive in the mail. So one of the things that we've seen and are working on a lot, and I think this is going to be the future of background screening, not just in Canada, but abroad, is you know, while the ID verification advancements simplify the screening process up front, I think the back half of that, issuing portable digital credentials will really simplify everything on the back end. So if you need to show your credentials externally as well, you can do that at a moment's notice and they're easy to you know, revoke and, and, and renew. So that's a really exciting trend that we're hearing a lot about. Uh, we don't often have HR folks coming to us saying, I want a digital credential solution. I don't know that that vocabulary is out there, <laughs> yeah. part of every HR you know lexicon, but uh, it, it's something that is presenting itself in different forms and different questions. And I think this is something that uh, I want to get the HR community thinking about more, that there are more digital modern solutions out there to these old fashioned ways that, that uh, things are, are still being done today. Absolutely. And what I love about that advancement and what you know we could potentially see in the future is that it's not just giving time back to your candidates and, you know, those who you are bringing into the door, making it easier, you know, it's making it easier for the client as well. So everyone's getting this kind of ease put back into the process from an advancement in technology that we're seeing, you know, for everything that you had just outlined there. So that's why I like sure. it so much because everyone's going to benefit from it for sure. For sure. I, I just heard from one of our, our, our clients last week that uh, it's, it's challenging for them getting their, their franchises and their partners to even comply with the the mandatory screening policy because they say, why would I want to spend X dollars yeah. on a check when the person's only going to be here for two or three months? And, you know, this is a way that just makes that process so much easier that, that can help enable uh, accurate and current screening. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's one of our biggest, you know, values of safety as well. So it's, you have companies asking questions like that and that is concerning because you you need to run you know these these processes um but something like this it does make it easier but you still are remaining safe and everyone will remain safe at the organization so yeah anything we can do to help our hr partners get rid of their spreadsheets uh that they yeah. don't want to manage uh, you know 
we hear horror stories of sorting hundreds of columns and, and following up with the, their own vendors or contractors to verify things. It, it can be such a nightmare. I have, I have so much yeah. uh, sympathy I guess, for, their, for their plight uh, with, with these outdated solutions. So hopefully tech will be able to make this a lot easier for us going forward. So it's, it's a real good time to be in the industry and working with the industry because there's lots of exciting things coming. I was gonna say you're definitely getting some of those head nods uh, on the other side of the screen right now. So well, <laughs> maybe some cheers. Too. You know, Bill, Bill 96 is not exciting to talk about, but this stuff really exciting. <laughs> We do have another exciting trend for sure. So uh, I want to talk about social media screening. So this is a trend we are seeing globally. Um, and actually, you know, Sterling just released a brand new research report called Hiring Reimagined. And from this report, 45% of HR professionals in North America said they are planning to implement social media screening in the near future. So this is something in the US and Canada, people want to bring it into their program. So can you comment on social screening in general? And then also so this statistic. Yeah, I love that this report came out and 45% and is obviously a good number, but it, it may not, it may be underselling it because it, the question, I, I don't recall how the question was framed, but there's probably a large swath that are already doing screening right. as well. And that's what I had discovered. Uh, I did a presentation for an HR association in Canada earlier this year. And of the couple of hundred attendees, uh, one of the poll questions I'd asked was, what are you doing today in terms of social media screening? And we gave a few options and over 40% were already doing screening and it was a mix of pre and post hire screening. And I think, it, yeah, it's only picking up in steam. You know, as you mentioned at the outset, I've been around in the industry for a long, long time. And, and for as long as I can remember, the in Canada anyway, the core four products of any background screening program uh, or services or criminal record checks, employment verifications, education verifications, and references. Over yeah. the years, we've seen credit checks drop off a bit to be more of a specialized uh, service for particular roles revolving around finance, much like driver's abstracts with transportation. But social media is really becoming, it's joining the big four. It's becoming yeah. one of the main services that's being sought after. And I think there's a bit of an evolution that it's not just a, a, a tick in a box anymore that these are the core four. I think there's a lot of reasons why people are looking to enhance their screening program. The term that I'm hearing a lot these days is enhanced character screening. I think yeah. that's more what we're looking at uh, that companies are looking to perform. Uh, and I think the acceleration has been fueled by a few re uh, or for a few reasons. One is uh, our polarized political climate. I think January 6th in the U.S. increased uh, attention to this. And in, in Canada, similarly, the, the, the trucker convoy protests in Ottawa. Uh, but I also think that just the rise in remote work and wanting to get to know candidates that you may not be meeting face to face. I think mm -hmm. everyone's trying to learn as much as possible about candidates when you don't get a chance to meet them. So I think a lot of these factors are, are converging and it's, it's, it's really, you know, we're seeing it, <laughs> to, to, say it to put it mildly. Uh, in terms of how popular the service is. Yeah, and what stands out to me with social media screening and your, you know, the idea of it becoming a part of the big four is, is interesting, but it's not surprising because if you are a frequent viewer of Sterling Live, we talk about social media screening all the time, even lately or the past six months to a year, it's been a trending topic. Um, you know, so we are talking about it. We're having our experts on to talk about it. And what stands out to me the most is, yes, with your background screening process, you are looking for potential marks that come through and you're kind you investigate them, things like that. Social media screening, what organizations have either told Sterling or just talking, you know, out about it is that you're looking for a cultural fit. So that's why the solution is so interesting because you're not actually looking to find something bad. You're looking to see if this individual will actually culturally fit into your organization and make sense for you to, like I said earlier, get them, get them in the door. Um, so it's really about being, you know, that authentic person, finding them. So that's what stands out to me about a solution like that the most. Yeah. And if I can add to that, yeah. uh, I, I'm borrowing an analogy from uh, from Ben, the CEO of Fama, mm. that is our partner in social media screening. But I was catching up with him at the uh, the, the Sherm conference uh, in New Orleans a couple of months ago, and he, he gave me a really good analogy that if you think of you know political opinion or political expression in terms of a horseshoe, you're not trying to look at the the very mild views that are in the middle, but you're trying what you want to capture are you know, the extreme opinions that are on the fringes, you know, on the edges of each side of that horseshoe. That's what you want to be aware of to make sure that you're 
promoting the, the workplace culture that you want that's that's likely inclusive and diverse and and you know that you don't want anything to tarnish your brand either yeah. i think that's another important component and why we're seeing this done not just pre-hire to ensure that people are the right fit and that they're not expressing extreme views but also once they're on board with your organization that if your brand is being tagged with these extremist views mm -hmm. uh you know hate speech, racism, things like yep. that, that, that you're aware of the situation before your competitor or the media is or, or your customers and that you're able to address it internally. So yeah, I, I think that it stands to reason that it's popular on both sides for ensuring mm -hmm. that there's a good cultural fit and that you're protecting your brand and your the culture that you're trying to build in your workplace. Absolutely. I wish we had like a like a picture of a horseshoe that I could pop up on screen, but it's a good, really good <laughs> analogy. It makes a, a lot of sense when trying to explain, you know, background screening is not, you know, always easy. It is complex. So when we are talking about it and kind of peeling back the layers, I do love analogies like that. Cause I do think our audience really, you know, is attracted to it and totally understands it a little bit more. So I love that. So thank you to you. And thanks to Ben, obviously for sharing that with you. You didn't tell me I should bring props, Caitlin, to the I know. Sterling Live. I'll bring a horseshoe next time. I don't think we've <laughs> ever, I don't think we've ever had props on Sterling Live. Maybe that's the next phase. So we'll see. <laughs> All righty. So next phase, next question. Um, this is my final question for you today. Um, let's talk about fair chance. So when it comes to fair chance hiring in Canada, you know, what does that really look like right now, um, like today? Well, I think there's been some very good, there's been some very good progress over the last mm -hmm. few years. So again, if I, if we go back and hop in our time machine, go back to 2005, when I first joined the industry back then, Often, one of my first roles was reaching out to our customers to say, Caitlin's got a, a criminal record. It was an mm -hmm. offense for theft. Uh, you know, a lot of the times the clients were just, oh, they've got an offense, not hiring them. It was yep. just a complete non-starter. And, uh, you know, obviously our, our understanding of this has evolved over time. And I think, you know, now we're in a space where the overwhelming majority of employers that certainly the ones that I speak with from firsthand experience, they understand a bit more about the practice of hiring people with criminal records that, you uh, you know, there are good things that you can do, uh, indicate in the job posting that a check will be conducted, uh, but make it clear that people with records are encouraged to apply. Don't ask a ton of questions up front. I know in the U.S. the ban the box legislation is required in certain states. You know, th there's that's kind of the trend in, in, in Canada as well, not so much without right banning, but just being conscientious of when you're asking for the criminal record check, it, you know. Decide if you like them and they're a good fit and then do the criminal record check. Don't right. do not do it too early in the process where you're disqualifying people who might be absolutely amazing for your organization. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So make it sure that they're encouraged to apply and, and make it sure that any record found will be considered on an individualized basis. You know, records that aren't recent or that aren't relevant to the job should not result in an adverse action. So not only having that policy, first of all, but, you know, it probably is good for you to, to communicate that with your candidates as well, to not dissuade some really awesome people from applying because they're they're fearful of that experience. So, um, you know, we do find that, you know, from what we see in terms of declarations on consent forms, that about three quarters of candidates are fully forthcoming about their criminal past. So, you know, for them, if they're, if they're telling you everything and it happened a long time ago and it's not relevant to the role, you know, I yeah. think that shows that, that behavior is behind them and it's nothing to worry about and they could be a, a great asset to your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely seeing some changes there for sure. Yeah, yeah. So not trying to be too too preachy about it by any means, but you know, there are similarities between the US and Canada in that regard in terms of the initiatives and, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's for the better. Yeah. All right. So if you are watching live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube right now, and you have any final questions, please send them over in the comment section across these three platforms. As we wait for potential any new questions to come in, I would love to just get you know your final thoughts from today's episode, any topic that we discuss, whatever you would like to leave our audience with today. Sure. I think... Uh... The takeaway I'd like everyone to have is that it's a really exciting time. I think as we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic, leaving all that stuff mm -hmm. behind us, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think we, with the disruption that we saw to our, our life, background screening was impacted by that positively in terms of ID verification. And I think there are there are a ton of exciting things on the way in terms of digital credentials, social media screening. There's lots that's new. So if you haven't, uh, spoken with your account manager lately, yeah. or if you'd like to connect with me uh, about screening in Canada, I, I would encourage you to do so just to, to learn a bit about what's new. 
uh, and, and make sure that your your program's optimized for 2022 and, and the years ahead. Yes, and I do, uh, you know, you guys can connect uh, if you're watching on LinkedIn, you can connect with Ian on there uh, if you need to talk, have any questions uh, after today's episode. Uh, any questions too or anything that you want to learn more about, you can go to um, our websites for uh, Canada. So it's Sterling Backtrack excuse me, backcheck.ca. Or um, we do obviously have our French website as well. So you have to go to sterlingbackcheck.ca backslash FR. So that's where you can find all things Sterling Backcheck. You can get some more uh, questions answered there. Obviously, you can connect with Ian on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, so at this time, we don't have any further questions. Uh, but great, great episode. You know, a lot to uncover. As you said, there's a lot of new things. So we'll probably have you back on again in a couple of months to keep talking about these changes, keep talking about these new updates, because everyone knows every time we hop on a Sterling Live, there is something new to discuss. There is, you know, always that next big thing. So we're going to keep talking about it, keep our entire audience uh, informed. But I really love today's episode, really, really informative. So Ian, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Sterling Live. No problem. Thanks for having me, Caitlin. It was great to spend time with you and catch up. Of course. And thank you all for joining us and we will catch you on the next episode.